people. <laughs> okay, we are getting started up. Hello, everyone. Sorry about that. Grab something. Um, Welcome back to Insider's Guide to the Galaxy. Uh, and so you know the drill, uh, put your name in the chat, where you're coming from, how you're doing. Did, have you seen Comet C-2022? Is that the name of it? I yes? just call it Comet E3. Comet E3. Uh, if you were at our Explore the Night Sky, we took this picture then. Um, has it, has anybody had a break in the clouds? I did. I saw it on Sunday night. That's, ex I have not gone out to see it yet. I, I feel like. Uh, I'll actually, I forgot to mention, Samantha, that uh, I thought I had spent a few minutes just recapping the, the passage the you know, where it is these days. So we'll spend a few awesome. minutes at the top doing that. Yeah. Cause it's getting, um, it's getting even better to, uh, look at now. Before in like the earlier evenings, it was very close to the horizon, but now it's more close to the sky. Hello, everyone. Okay, we'll give 30 more seconds as people file in. Hello to YouTube, our YouTube um, crowd as well. For those of you watching on YouTube, just a reminder, everything we say that goes into the chat will be put into the description box of the YouTube video, and we will be monitoring both chats. Um, both on Zoom and on YouTube. Hello. Hello from Kitchener. You're very close to me there. The last cloudy weather has moved in just a smidge. <clears throat> okay. Yes. Um, so without further ado, I don't have any crazy announcements from national office. We don't have any upcoming events. Um, other than stay tuned to our newsletter, because all these events we do talk about usually get released there first. And without further ado, I'm going to let Chris, and since we're on the, as you said, since we're on the topic of Comet, let's just chat about that for a little bit. <laughs> yeah, so let's spend a couple of minutes just um, reviewing where the Comet's up, what it's up to, and give everybody some uh, tips on where to find it. On Sunday night, I went out. I happened to be clear. It's not been very clear very often here in Toronto, but it happened to be clear. Moon was up, but gave it a go. And I, and I remembered because I had written in my skylights that that night the comet was going to be on the line connecting Polaris to Doobie, the lip of the Big Dipper, a third of the way along. So I just binoculars, hunted for a while, found it. So that was, that's cool. And I saw a few other people on, uh, on uh, Twitter noting it as well. So let me just uh, share my screen here. And I'll do a little bit of chatting about where that's up and what that's up to. Okay, so what I've got here is the sky over Montreal. I just I just pick like to pick another city for a change, other than uh, other than where I am here in the Toronto area. So this is the sky this evening at six o'clock. Now it's not really that dark at six o'clock. I think um, the end of astronomical twilight, when the sky gets truly dark, is arriving around six thirty. So you know if I set this to six thirty or so then that'll be a truly dark sky. And this is the path of the comet using the Stellarium tool to plot the ephemeris of an object. So what the, what the buzz is about is that this comet is still growing a little bit in brightness. It's predicted to be, become at its brightest on basically during the daytime on February 1st. That's when it's absolutely at its closest point to the Earth. I think I set it to be yeah, about midday in the Americas is when that what will happen. So really, that means that the best time for you to see it when it's at its potentially at its best would be Wednesday morning. Now, here's the thing. So if I just set this back a little bit and I go to Wednesday morning, so that's basically tomorrow uh, tomorrow morning. Um, we'll do this around five in the morning. So what happens is that you've got this moon in the sky. Let's see where's our moon here. Just draw my ecliptic. Here we go. So now we've got, here we go, February 1st. Yep, so you've got a moon in the sky and it'll actually set in the early, in the early, in around 5 a.m. it'll set. So if you're up kind of around 5 a.m. to 6 a.m. before astronomical twilight really starts, 
you can check out the comment. Now, have I got the right comment? There it is. So here it is up here. It'll be at that point, uh, tomorrow morning before dawn, it'll be to the lower left of Polaris. Let me just put a, a measuring tool on here. The green circle is binoculars, by the way. Let me do this. So you're looking at one, 14 degrees or about 1.4 fist diameters. I think I noted that, uh, let's see, did I put the markers here? Yeah, I thought I, I thought I maybe mentioned some of the milestones you could use. It's kind of, you can kind of use the, the line from Polaris to Castor as your pointer is the direction you want to head. And basically you want to look, you know, about three binocular fields from Polaris or, you know, 1.4 fist diameters. Um, if you're using something like Stellarium or the Sky Safari app, one of my best tips is to make sure that you've recently updated the, uh, the, the minor body database, which if you go to in Sky Safari, if you go to the settings, click on solar system and scroll down, you'll see that there's a button to manually update the settings. That way that'll account for any small changes in the comet's orbit over the next little bit. And what you really want to do maybe before you start searching with your binoculars is familiarize yourself with the more prominent stars that might be in the field of view with the binoculars. So in this case, you know, I'd be checking out the star here, which is a magnitude four and a half. You might look for some asterisms that you can reference to. Actually, if you go down here to the lower left of the comet, you're gonna see these two reasonably bright stars, magnitude five stars, 42 and 43 cam. So you'll be able to spot them in your binoculars quite distinctly. And then if you set kind of the pair of them, one of each at the edge of your field of view, then you could start looking at the other side of the field of view for the fuzzy blob of the comet. I looked at it on Sunday night, a couple of days before, you know, before its peak. And um, it was pretty underwhelming, I felt. I mean, it's not all that the media are making it cracked up to be. I felt I could maybe get a hint of greenish, it's gray or green, tint to it. I've definitely seen green color on comets through a telescope, but through binoculars, maybe not so much. But uh, the predictions say that it's going to reach about magnitude five and a half or so um, as it passes Earth. And just if anyone's interested, I'll show you the geometry of the orbit and how this is all working. I think I may have shown this before. But this is a website. You can go to the, the skylive.com and you can find 3D models of things like like these comets. And here you can set the date and time below. So if I wiggle this model around, you can see the sun here, you've got the Earth's orbit in blue, and the comet is diving down through the solar system between the orbits of Earth and Mars. And just the way the geometry works, the angle between or the distance between the Earth and the comet will be at a minimum, you know, basically February 1st. And from there, it's going to continue to dive down to the plane of the solar system and then start heading south. So right now, our, our northern sky points up this way. So we're seeing the comet appears in Earth's northern sky. And once it dips below the plane of the solar system, it's going to be sort of heading southbound in the sky and then eventually, you know, kind of fading in brightness and, and, and dropping out of sight. So this is the other few things you want to check for. So, uh, you know, it can be difficult to find a comet in a faint fuzzy comet in the sky, but if you can wait for it to pass a couple of milestones, then you can really use those as your guides. So I'm actually going to switch this up. Let's go back to this evening sky so we can see it tonight. So here's the sky around 9 p.m. Obviously, the comet's going to be most visible when it's highest in the sky, and that, that means above Polaris. So that's basically higher than Polaris around 9 p.m. is a good time, 8 or 9 p.m. And over the next number of nights, it's going to it's gonna move quite a bit, basically a palm's width or six degrees higher every night. So here's tomorrow night, the night after, the night after, the night after. And the really neat thing is when we get to the fifth, so what day of the week is that? That's Sunday, Saturday or Sunday? Put on my calendar in front of me here. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Next Sunday night. So it's going to be actually, the comet's going to be hanging out really close to Capella. So it's just a couple of finger widths below Capella. And then the following evening on the 6th, 
it's going to be telescope close to one of the kid star. These three, this triangle of stars near Capella, the goat star, these three are named the kids, nicknamed the kids, as in baby goats. And this star here will be right beside the comet on next, that would be next Monday night, right? And then a few nights beyond that, obviously the comet's gonna be fading a little bit night by night, but the fun's gonna happen here when we get into around the 10th or 11th of February, when we'll have a couple of nights where the comet kind of shares the field of view of binoculars, maybe a wide field camera image of Mars with the comet and Mars. So that would be a neat opportunity for some, some photo opportunities. Uh, let's just turn on the symbols for the deep sky objects, I guess on, on or about the 13th of February, it'll be passing this uh, open cluster NGC 1647. That's basically what I'd recommend is sort of pick some of these nights if you have trouble seeing it where you are. I saw it from my driveway in Thornhill, which had lots of street lights and reflections off the snow on the ground. So the conditions weren't very dark. Here's another good night where it's near this bright star, Hasella, which is one of the one of the rings, ring stars in Capella in Origa on the 8th. Just go back a bit here. So that's sort of an update on what you can look for. A few of the nights that you can mark on your calendar. Hopefully you get some clear skies and um, times when it would be absolutely dead easy to find it next to something bright. Any questions before I put that away? I don't see any in the chat. Um, thank you for those who show, shared that they saw it and their experience. It's great to hear um, and hope everybody gets a chance to see it in the next little bit. What software? We're using Stellarium here. This is the Stellarium software and then the other one with the orbital path. I uh, put a link to the skylive.com specifically for uh, Comet E3 in the chat on both YouTube and on Zoom. Oh, here it is. Can it be viewed from inside house with the glass window? No. <laughs> Too faint. No. It's, it's, I would say, I found it barely visible. I mean, I'm an experienced observer. Um, viewing it two, three nights before its supposed peak. And I even, I even had trouble finding it. Once I saw, once I could see it, you know, and, and watch it for a bit, then it was really obviously a comet, but the tail was very, very subtle. The fuzzy star sort of shape of it was very subtle. So it's not something that you can see in marginal conditions. You know, you've got to either know what you're looking for or get outside. You know, if, if the moon is up, stand in a spot where the moon is blocked, where you can see the North Celestial Pole, not have the moon kind of on your shoulder, shining on your shoulder. That would be my advice for the next few nights. Obviously, but we're going to lose the moon in the next couple, you know, in the next week or so. So even the week beyond the peak will be, um, you know, we're getting a full moon later this week and then the moon will start moving out of, out of the picture. So we'll get better views. So that also kind of answers someone's question. There's not much of a tail on this one that you can see. So if you look at the, um, the images that you see online, you see lots of images of a very narrow and straight ion tail directly pointing directly away from the sun. Um, the, so the, that's the tail that's produced by the ionized um, atoms that are being, and they're being pushed by the solar wind directly away from the sun. The dust tail, which tends to be the debris tail as the comet leaves in its path and its track in its track that it's, um, that it's come from, um, is, tend, is looked to be, to be a bit fainter and um, quite broad and wedge shaped. So not very tail like. So yeah, the pictures of this comet are a little bit odd from what we're used to, but um, yeah, it's worth taking pictures as you saw. Um, so somebody just kind of questioned about the pictures. Uh, do you have any good resources to uh, learn about taking pictures with comets or do you have any suggestions for the tracking? So, yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not an imager really, but um, if you follow Rask's own Alan Dyer, um, he posts his pictures on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and so on. Um, I mentioned in my skylights, there's a gentleman on Twitter. I think his, his name is, let me just bring up his, his profile here. I think it's at Comet with a K. Let's find it here. Okay.
to do, sorry about that. Should have had this ready to go. It's okay. I think it's at comet with a K one, two, three, four, something like that. Just open it up. Okay. Mm. For rural skies, would it not be the best time for evening viewing to begin on February 8th when the moon begins setting later? Um, so apparently, yes. So that was, uh, I'll let you finish that. And that's our next question we have. Well, yes and no. Okay. Because you're, you're really dealing with a trade-off <clears throat> because yes, the moon washes out the sky and, and diminishes the comet somewhat, but it's also going to be fading in intensity quite steeply over the next little while. So I wouldn't wait. What I would do is I would just keep trying and hopefully your views get better and better as the moon disappears. That's the way I would do it. Uh, here's the, here's the person that I was going to mention on Twitter at K O M E T one, two, three, J A G E R at Comet one, two, three Jager. And he's been putting lots of pictures of the comet up. He's in Germany. Yeah, great questions. Anybody else? K O M E T one, two, three, J A G E R. G E R. Okay. There we go. <laughs> Um, somebody also put, from what I read, use a 200 millimeter F 2.8 lenses, 1600 ISO, one to two seconds. However, they've not tried it themselves. So yeah, it's definitely, I would just kind of Google to see if any like um, experienced astrophotographers have written. Uh, and there we have a link to Alan Dyer's books. Okay, I think that is all of our questions on the comet. If you guys remember anything, we can chat about it at the end of our next session as well section of this not next session sure we well or or we could have a we could have everybody show and tell their their common images on a future session yeah i only have the one behind me <laughs> all right let's move on to the milky way and then we'll do the uh some cold weather observing and then we'll wrap the wrap up at the end with our finest ngc so the milky way obviously is our home galaxy it's you know, roughly disc shaped. It's about a oh, 20 to one width to thickness of its disc and a central bulge in the center. And it's about roughly 100,000 light years across, counting the visible, the visible material in, in the galaxy, not counting the dark matter halo and the much greater extent of that. But I'm going to just refer basically to the parts that we can see as we step out on a dark night. And so we sit about you know about midway through um to one side of the of the of the bulge inside the the thickness of the disc and that means that there are times of the year when we can look inward towards the center of our galaxy and other times where we see the outer rim of our galaxy and winter is the time of year when we're viewing the outer rim of the galaxy and i'm going to sort of walk us through the geometry of that here in a second so um just basics if you want to sort of follow along or see the Milky Way in the night sky these days. I mean, this is not the week for that because we have the bright moon in the sky um, actually passing across the Milky Way tonight or over the, over the next couple of nights. So here's, here's tonight, here's the waxing gibbous moon right smack on the Milky Way. So that's not great for seeing it, but another few nights next week, you'll be able to see it much more clearly. I'm just gonna advance the time a little bit later. So what we're seeing here is the Milky Way is rising from the southern horizon in late evening, right above sort of the back of Canis Major, the big dog, right beside the star Sirius. And it's quite intense where that where it is there. Then it rises up through Monoceros. Then it sort of splits the difference between Gemini and Orion, right through his club, his upraised armor club. Then it swings up through the lower half of Auriga runs through Perseus. Now, of course, we're heading down again. We were rising, now we're down again. Down through Perseus, okay? Then down through Cassiopeia. And then I'm just gonna go back in time a little bit here. And then sort of between skirts the edge of Cepheus, the king, Lacerta the lizard, and then we start heading into Deneb, Cygnus. So the Cygnus, Part of this of the Milky Way is the part we're used to seeing in the summer sky, where we're seeing that dark dust rift that passes through the Milky Way as it heads sort of through Cygnus. So that's kind of the beginnings of the summertime sky. We do get some of the obviously we get some of the 
Cassiopeia Sevi as part of the Milky Way in the summer as well. But basically the winter part is this sort of weaker part. And what I'm gonna do in Stellarium here is I'm just gonna show you a couple of things you can do to sort of play with the settings to make it even more um, pop in the software. So if you go down to your toolbar along the bottom, there are actually buttons that let you, that you hide the horizon or hide the daylight or hide the, the sky. And that's this one on the right. If I click that, you'll see I get more stars and a much brighter Milky Way. And the reason I got such a bright Milky Way is I went into the settings. The These are the F4 sky and viewing option settings. Going into the sky tab, and you can just increase the number for the Milky Way brightness. So I've got it set temp temporarily all the way up to five, just to make it very, very obvious on the, the zoom on the, yeah. Yeah. So that, that sort of gives you a sense of where it is in the sky with respect to the stars. Now, if you're familiar with the big, you know, winter, winter circle or winter hexagon, hexagon asterism, this year it's the winter heptagon because we have Mars as part of the loop. So that's the, um, the star Sirius, Rigel, Aldebaran, Mars this year, Capella, Castor Pollux, Procyon, and back to Sirius. And you can see the Milky Way runs right up through the center of that big, big uh, asterism. Now, let me bring up some markings on here. This is fun. So you can go into the F4 again, go into your markings tab, and there's an option here for the galactic equator. And what you're going to do is you're going to do yes, yes, yes. And this gives you the coordinates, the numbers, and the path of it. So I don't know if it's that easy to see. Maybe I'll change this to yellow so you can see it a little bit better. Like this nice and bright. Here's a bright day glow green. Oops, did that work? Here we go. Do that one more time. Day glow green. Okay. Let's say okay. So now I can really see it more obviously. So these coordinates that are plotted on here, these are the kind of galactic longitude coordinates. And so what we're looking at is the center of our galaxy at coordinate zero and the opposite, the exact opposite rim of our galaxy at 180 degrees. And you can see where it is in the sky. It's near the northern horn tip star of Taurus, the star Elnath that kind of is shared between Auriga and Taurus. And so if you're just sort of wondering, that's where it is in the sky. Now, the Milky Way itself isn't dimmest there. In theory, that should be dimmest there because that's the kind of the, the least amount we're looking through. But in fact, we've got this other competing factor, which is the dust. There's a obscure dust, opaque dust that lies in the plane of our galaxy that hinders our view of the, the stars in the Milky Way and dims them. And as I mentioned, we saw we get that a lot in the summertime sky. We can see those dust lanes. Now in the summertime, the dust in the Milky Way tends to split it into two sort of parallel cracks near the constellation of Cygnus. But in the winter sky, the winter Milky Way, that dust doesn't really do that, but what it does is it kind of interrupts it. So you can see here, there's a spot kind of between Capella and Cassiopeia, kind of centered around uh, the bright star Mirfak, where that dust is completely attenuating the stars or the light of the Milky Way and making it much dimmer. So that's something that you can um, look for when you're out on a clear night. And I think I've got, actually a, uh, an alternate view of the Milky Way. So this is actually taken from the Starry Night software where you can actually plot or view an all sky image in infrared light. And you can see now in infrared light without the, the impact, as much of the impact of the dust that you can kind of see, it's still a little bit dimmer kind of near Perseus, but it is basically at a minimum kind of right where Arrive is, that's as it should be. That's kind of cool. But yeah, we're, look, we're, we're human beings. We look in the visible spectrum. So this is the view we get. Uh, let's see. I think that's kind of the way I wanted to leave that, you know, basically when you're out. So let's talk about what you can see. So a little bit of sightseeing um, with, uh, with viewing the winter Milky Way. So first off, you know, while you're out, see if you can just stand outside on a clear, dark night. And if you've got those nice dark rural skies, I envy you because we don't have them here in the GTA. But you know, you can actually start measuring the, the width of the Milky Way and see how it, the width of its 
band across the sky diminishes as you rise up from the southeastern horizon. Look for that patch of darkness that separates it or breaks it up a little bit near uh, Perseus. And then you can see it actually building again. And you can also pick up you know, some more interruptions or dust. So, so for example, one of the things you might notice is that the Milky Way tends to be darker than it should be on one half, the half that sort of runs from, you know, across the Polaris side of Cassiopeia and Cepheus. So it really, and if I can turn that marker off, it's much more obvious when that's not showing here for a second. So you can really kind of see it looks like it's, it's interrupted and there should be much more brightness here than there is because of that dust. Now, the other neat thing is, um, let's bring this back. So if you look at the coordinates on here, go back to the Southern horizon. So if I bring up the, uh, bring this to late evening and put the Milky Way above the Southern horizon, this is kind of the limit to what Canadians can see of the Milky Way. So we can see everything from here up. And of course, depending on your city, and your latitude, you might not even be able to see this far south as we can in, say, Montreal or, or southwestern Ontario. But if you can see this bright star Naos, which is the Zeta Popeye, that's kind of where the limit of what we can see. And that's a shame because we're missing, you know, not far below this is where we get all that really famous stuff that we get in the summer Milky Way or we get in the Milky Way from the southern hemisphere. So if I hide the horizon and dive down below the horizon, the Earth invisible. You can see here we've got the Eta Carina Nebula, which is just, you know, not that far below the horizon, just uh, tens of degrees. And then we get Crux, the Southern Cross. We get the Dark Coal Sack. And then I don't know if you've been to the Southern Hemisphere, but I'm just going to set it like this for a second. And can you see the Coal Sack has a little point on the right-hand side? And imagine that this is uh, an ostrich or an emu's head, and that's his beak. And then his neck comes down here, and then the Milky Way dust spreads out and expands a little bit more down here. And this is called the Great Emu. So if you do visit the Southern Hemisphere at a time of the year where the Milky Way is nice and high, you can see that Great Emu. And that's part of the, uh, the star lore of the Indigenous peoples that live, you know, in New Zealand and Australia, places like that. Because that, that shape is so obvious to, to see when you're there in the summer. And then if I come around to the other side of this, we pick up the bottom of Scorpius and this sort of bend at the bottom of Scorpius, Zeta Scorpii, this is sort of the cutoff for Canadians. So we can see the Milky Way from here on out, from here on to the east of this. So that section between here and Naos is the part that we never get from Canada. So it's good incentive to book a trip someday if you're an avid, avid stargazer, you do want to get down to the Southern Hemisphere and someday to pick up all that sky that you'd ever get to see from here. All we right. have a question about um, when is the Milky Way visible, uh, specifically in the Toronto area, but generally, um, I guess, this time of year for across Canada. Like what time? Yeah, so it's there. It's there right away. So let me just wind back here to the earlier evening. So in fact, in early evening, once once it, one dusk once dusk arrives, you know it's already visible. It's already there. Um, by the time you can see see the star Sirius, which you know is a very obvious star, maybe catch your eye out the window, um, then that's it. You just look to the to the left of that, and you've got the Milky Way up and arcing overhead. Here's the uh, their little green. That's the zenith. So the zenith at you know in early evening. This is seven p.m. Uh, tonight. So the zenith is sort of near the bright star Murfak, and that's kind of near the center of the galaxy right overhead. So it arcs right overhead from early evening. And then the question is, well, how late, how late at night can you see it? So let's just advance hour by hour. So around, as I mentioned, around 11 o'clock nowadays is when you'll get that absolute, you know, last vestiges um, when it's over the southern horizon. But for this point, you're losing, you know, some of the Lacerda part. And if you advance another couple of hours, then by the time we get after midnight, then we're starting to get that springtime effect. So, you know, spring is galaxy season because 
the Milky Way tends to hug the horizon and we just give you an all sky view. So as we get into the two and three o'clock in the morning nowadays, we're getting the spring constellations overhead. And at the same time, we're getting the Milky Way diving down and starting to hug the horizon. And that's what gives us that beautiful view or vista of the galaxies in the springtime. So if you wanna enjoy the winter Milky Way, you really wanna do it uh, right after dusk, because if you leave it too late in the evening, then you're gonna start, it's gonna start sinking lower in the sky for you. Yeah, so you're good until about one o'clock and then you're getting down into the time where it's getting too low. Yeah, cool question. Anything else? We have a question, which we already went over, um, something about shooting the Milky Way uh, galaxy. We actually, at our last General Assembly, uh, Alan Dyer gave a workshop, which then he offered to be put on our YouTube channel. So I'm going to share a link of how to shoot the Milky Way, um, Alan Dyer's workshop, and that should be quite helpful for that, those interested. Yeah, no, a lot of, there are a lot of rascals and even article, articles in Sky News where um, there, that's going to be covered more and more. So, you know, keep your, keep your eyes to that and you'll find lots of guidance on that. Um, so one last thing I was going to mention. So this is kind of the, you know, the visual, just head out with your, with your um, plain old eyes and look up um, and, and appreciate the Milky Way. Um, one thought I had is it might be fun to challenge yourself to sketch the outline and see if you can figure out where those dark patches are, where they, where they end and where they begin. And then later come back and look at a photograph and see how well you did. So that would be kind of a fun, challenging thing to do. All right, so let's get into some um, exploration of the Milky Way using binoculars. And I'm gonna give a shout out to Alan because in the current issue of Sky News, he did a uh, binoculars tour of the winter Milky Way on pages over here, 26. So check out Alan's article. And I'm not gonna mention everything he mentioned, um, well, I'll mention them in passing, but I'm going to highlight some additional things, but I'll, I'll point out some of the ones that he actually talked about in his article. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, as I said, I, I cranked up the brightness of the Milky Way in Stellarium. I put on a green ring that roughly matches the field of view of, you know, 10, um, 12 by 42 or 10 by 42 or 10 by 50 binoculars, about six degrees of the sky. And we'll sort of look at some of the different things that you want to pay attention to when you want to look at some of the kind of highlights. So I'm actually going to really only focus on the Milky Way proper, the sort of center lane of it, the central band. So that means I'm not really going to talk about, you know, the Orion Nebula, the Pleiades, the Hyades. Those are mentioned in Alan's article. So, you know, they're uh, every, obviously everything's part of the Milky Way, but I'm just going to really focus on following that, uh, that stream across the sky, what you can see within it. So for starting off, we've got some nice objects down here in the cell. Let's just get this a little bit later so we can get a little bit more of the constellation Puppas peeking up. And again, if you're in a northerly city like Edmonton, um, you know, you're going to be limited to your horizons going to cut off some of these, but <clears throat> Most of these will be fine for everybody in Canada. So the first one I've got is M41. I'll just bring these up so we can see some labels on them. I'm just going to dial down some of the intensity of the. So you can dial up how many, dial up and down how many features are highlighted. I'm since I'm really only interested in binoculars, I can dial the number down a little bit. So here we've got um, Messier 41. So Messier 41 actually shares the binocular field with Sirius, but you don't want to have Sirius in the field while you're looking at it because that'll be extra bright. So just hide Sirius above the binoculars and check out Messier 41. So that's a great one to check out. That's inside the body of the big dog. And then over here to the upper left of that, so now you've got Sirius here on the right-hand side, we've got the nice pair of bright clumps that you can see here. These are two open clusters, Messier 46 and Messier 47. So those are great ones to check out. Then if we go back and kind of swing up to the upper left of Sirius, and if you can see the, the nose star of the dog, theta, if you put that theta kind of 
you know, just outside your binoculars field of view, you can check out Messier 50, a nice open cluster Messier 50. And again, so all of those were Alan Dyer picks. So 47, 46, 41, and 50 were all mentioned or highlighted. He's given some additional um, things, to, things to look at, look for when you're observing those uh, targets in the article. All right, let's swing up a little bit higher. Let's go into Monoceros. You know, Monoceros doesn't have very bright stars. So it's, you know, it's kind of overlooked a lot of the time because you've got spectacular Orion sitting right to the right-hand side of it. But there are some really cool features to check out. And my favorite has got to be the Rosette Nebula. So the Rosette Nebula sits here. It's about, you know, basically one and a half binocular fields to the east or left of Betelgeuse. And it's, Really, if you've got a dark moonless sky, it's no problem finding it in binoculars. It's a large, large-ish hazy patch in the binoculars. It's got a nice clump of young stars, a nice star cluster embedded within it. So if you're using a telescope and your skies aren't particularly dark, um, you'll see that star cluster inside the, the Rosette Nebula. And then if you have maybe uh, an oxygen three filter or an ultra high contrast filter, pop that in and you should start to see the surrounding glow of the rosette around. So that's a great object. That's Messier, uh, Caldwell 50. It's not a Messier target, it's a Caldwell target. So it's NGC 2244. That's a great one. And if you swing your binoculars up a little bit higher and just a, just a bit of a word of warning, sometimes Stellarium makes things look a little bit brighter than they really are. So this reflection nebula on over here, not sure that I would I would see it that well or pay that much attention to it. You know, if you're imaging or something, by all means. But in terms of binoculars and visual observing, um, you want to go stop next to this, this patch of the sky. So this is actually the Christmas tree cluster and the cone nebula. So you can see here's the big Christmas tree. It's upside down. Kind of the Christmas star is at the bottom here, a little cone is a little bit of uh, opaque gas, opaque dust that gives you a, a this sort of wedge shaped cone shape in it. But the um, the gas forming region, the star forming region has produced some nice stars, hot young stars within the, that are show up nicely in binoculars. And then if you've got a really dark sky, you can see if you can pick up any of the emission nebula. And of course, um, in imagers, imagers can pick that up. Would you well. be able to, just a question, um... We imaged this for our Expo Night Sky, and there was a fox face as well. Would that be possible to see in like a ground telescope or mostly larger telescopes? So yeah, we're going to talk about the um, we're going to talk about the fox face bat nebula in our finest NGC. Okay. So yeah, sorry for jumping ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, that's fine. That's fine. So this is actually this is actually nicknamed the fox fur. I'm not sure. Maybe that's outline here is a fox's head. I'm not sure what they mean by that, but. But yeah, yeah, we can talk about that here at the end of the session today. That's a little sneak peek. Okay, where are we at? So here we are, we're coming up, we're starting to enter the feet of Gemini and the upraised club of Orion. And I'm not mentioning everything. So there are lots of little, you can see every little colored um, symbol on here represents another deep sky object. I'm really only focusing on the, the big and bright ones for now. So if we head up, Following the Milky Way, it's starting to fade from view here now. We're getting up into the feet of Castor, and you're going to pick up M35, which is the shoe buckle cluster. And that's also a really nice object in binoculars. I'm over, I'm skipping past this little bright blob down below it here for a moment. I'll come back to that in a minute. And then from the shoe buckle, we keep going. And again, what I'm doing is I'm I'm crossing the zeniths. So you can see the Milky Way seems to be going horizontal here as I move along, just because I'm sort of changing my geometry in the sky. We get into the ring of Auriga and we pick up the three bright open clusters, M36, 37, and 38, which are nicely visible in binoculars on a dark night within Auriga. There are also a couple of others in here. There's one called uh, the letter Y cluster or NGC 1893, so you can look for that one. And a number of these other ones might show up depending on your, you know, how big your binoculars are and your sky conditions. So hunt around. Moving along, we're starting to head now through that dark zone. And then we get into 
the Star Murfak. So the Star Murfak itself is surrounded by a really spectacular, a loose grouping of uh, hot O and B class stars. It's called the um, the OB, um, the Alpha Persei moving group because they're moving as a as a cohort through the galaxy, or the um, the OB association that has a number of nicknames for it. But you can just point your binoculars at Murfak and then notice all of the other neat bright stars in a group around. Then from here, we can look, we've got two ways we can go. We're gonna go down to the left first. You've got Messier 34, which is a nice open cluster down here to the near the star um, Algol, the variable star Algol, which is right here. And that's a cool object to look at. And then obviously we're gonna be taking a minute or two to check out the double cluster. So this is NGC 884 and 869, the double cluster fantastic in binoculars don't just you know don't just give it a quick look but when you're looking pay attention to the characteristics of the various clusters you know is it denser is it is it looser how many stars can you see that sort of thing we've covered some of this sort of these tips in some of our previous um ngc ngc unit uh, ngc minute section i'm going to pass by these these pink spots in them for a minute i'm going to come back when you get to uh, Cassiopeia, Cassiopeia is just littered with open clusters. I mean, I've dialed down the number displayed here. If I crank the settings up in Stellarium, it'll just fill the screen with all kinds of symbols and labels. They're everywhere. But the ones that are dominant in binoculars would include uh, NGC 663, which is um, the lawnmower cluster. It's easy to find because it sort of sits just outside the line connecting the two end stars of the W, second and rock bottom. So that's a nice one. Then down here, there's the NGC 457. This is the Dragonfly Owl ET cluster. There's the two eyes, the arc of stars forming the wings, the little body, and then the feet are down here. So that's a, that's a really neat one to look at as well. And that to find that one, I usually try to make a right angle triangle with Navi and Rukba. And that's a great way of picking that one up. The granite. It's tiny in binoculars, but you can definitely see the bright patch of it. Remember, know where it is and come back with your telescope and check it out, uh, zoomed in a little bit later. All right, nearly done our binoculars tour. We're going to head down to the bottom side of Cassiopeia. Now we're heading towards the northwestern sky, running down the northwestern sky. And we're going to pick up NGC 7789. That's Caroline's Rose. So again, it's not a Messier object. It's a, little, it was a, it's a little bit faint, but it's extremely rich, large, rich, open cluster. Um, so that's a great one to check out. And again, it's one of the, I think it's one of the finest NGCs in RASC's list. And finally, my last one that I'm going to mention on this stop. Oh, and by the way, before you, uh, you know, before you finish your tour of the Milky Way, nip on over and check out Delta Cephei. Delta Cephei is this star right here. It actually forms a triangle with this corner star, Zeta, Epsilon, and Delta. And Delta is that classic Delta Cephei, Cepheid variable um, star. It's the sort of originator of that class of type of stars. And what you wanna do is take a look at the trio. And if Delta is as bright as Zeta, it's near its peak brightness. And when it's dim as Epsilon, it's near its minimum brightness. And it varies over about a forget the exact period, but um, basically it doubles doubles and halves in brightness and you can compare them to the other two stars. That's a neat thing to do. And even if you're in the neighborhood, you can check out the really rich red garnet star Mu Cephei while you're in the neighborhood. Uh, last up, I've got Messier 39, which is a nice rich cluster. Again, it's going to be sinking. So you wanna catch that one in earlier in the evening, but it's a little bit higher in the sky. So those are my uh, those are my top tips for sort of binoculars, and you're going to get distracted by all kinds of additional things as you go. Any questions, so comments? We have um, a couple questions. If you've asked a question and I haven't answered it yet, just I'm going to move some of them to the end, just so they they kind of match up the topics. Uh, we have one question about um, what can you see from windows? What do you need out with binocular? 
Uh, my answer to that is most of the stuff we're talking about is quite faint, especially in suburban sky. You would need to actually be outside, even at the bright M13, um, which is in the summer, but that's a globular cluster quite bright. I have issues seeing it in darker skies, like with binoculars. Uh, the ones you'd basically really see would be darker skies. You're looking at constellations probably out your window. I don't know if, Chris, do you have anything to add to that? But So, you know, astronomers typically don't recommend observing from inside. Um, definitely through a window, you know, you might get a reasonable view of the moon or bright, some bright star, individual stars through the, through the window. If you can, if you want to, if you're, if your mobility is limited or if you're, you know, worried about the cold, um, one suggestion would be to, you know, open the window, take the screen off. So you're looking out an opening into the sky. That'll help some because it'll eliminate some reflections and, you know, strange things that windows do to the op, to your view. So you might be able to see some of these marginally dimmer things um, if you're, you know, sitting in a in a nice dark room and your eyes are dark adapted. So that that would be a possibility. But the window would have to be open and uh, the screen taken out for a good view. I think we have um, another question about binoculars. What would be a good size binoculars? Um, I usually recommend for beginners, and so the one I use is about ten by fifties. Um, they're pretty standard. Chris, I know you have a lot more experience though with binoculars. Yeah, so I'm I, I'm actually spoiled. I bought a pair of the um, image stabilized ten by forty twos, which really they kind of punch above their weight because they're so stable that it's almost like having a bigger pair. They're they are expensive though. But you know, Alan Alan does a lot of his um, stories around binocular stargazing, and he mentions the 11, 11 by forty two um size range as a good option because they're not too heavy. You know, kids can hold them. I'm, I'm talking about the non you know, non-image stabilized type, just the basic 11 by 42s, 10 by 50s. So those are those are super. And a lot of people have them already for birding or for sports. So they would be fine. Um, you know, the ones that 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 I always am a little bit disappointed with, I got a pair of little sort of opera glass types with maybe a um, um you know eight by twenty-five or eight by thirty, that kind of thing. And they're really not that great. Um, you'll be able to see some of these bright clumps, bright clusters and that kind of thing. But if you can get a hold of the 10 by 42, 10 by 42s or 10 by 50s, that's fine. You know, I'm not one that really goes a lot for the big, you know, 15 by 70, the big beast binoculars. You really need a tripod for those and, and uh, they're great, but, you know, you have to have something to mount them. I, I'm of the uh, whatever you have, use it yeah. to go outside. Whatever you can afford and it's useful for you, use it. Um, don't try to like feel like you have to get the best stuff. You can see a lot of this stuff without um, the really expensive binoculars. Um, so we have one question kind of about seeing the Milky Way in the summer is when you look for the Milky Way in the summer is the best time to see it like in the middle of the night, like 1 a.m. to 5 a.m. or is it around the same time? um as the winter no it's definitely going to be later so we're talking here um three hours after sunset the idea is that you want the sky to be as dark as it can be and that kicks in once the once the sun is more than 18 degrees below the horizon so astronomers call that the end of astronomical twilight so you've got your your after sunset twilight your civil twilight then you get your nautical twilight where the sun is dipping even farther below the horizon. And then your astronomical twilight is where the sun is descending between 12 and 18 degrees below the horizon. Once it's below that, the sky is effectively completely dark for the night until it picks up before, before dawn again. So the difference is that the time of sunset. So obviously this time of year at the end of January, we're looking at sunsets around, what is it, around five o'clock. So astronomical twilights, completed and the sky is fully dark around 6 30 6 30 to 7 depending on your latitude so i so, just threw a link in the chat for timeanddate.com yeah, i we'll use, use we've talked about this in the past um since we i operate the telescope in california i have issues i use that almost every single night to find exactly when astronomical twilight starts it will tell you like down to the minute where it's where the sun's going to be so that really helps plan they do it for every location i haven't found a location i can't yet um, another question, which I'm not going to get you to answer, but I'm going to read it. So because I'm sure we're going to get into it, how to best climatize binoculars in the cold um, and how do you let them cool down to ambient temp? But because I know your notes, I know we're going to talk about stuff like that. Yeah. 
we're going to get into that a little bit. So um, that's about it. And yeah, we can move on to. Okay. So let me just finish up by mentioning a couple of the things I passed over that. So all of the above, everything I mentioned already, um, except for the big swaths of dark dust, would be great to go back and check out with your telescope, any size of a telescope. Okay. So keep that list and be ready to find it, find it with the binoculars and then zoom in on it with your telescope. You'll be heavily rewarded. And what's neat is that when you do that, you'll find little things that are in the neighborhood, you know, sharing the eyepiece view with the main target. You'll, you'll, you'll stumble upon more and more things to check out. So that's a great thing, great approach to take. But the other thing is you might want to be, you might be an imager. You want, want to consider some parts of the Milky Way that are particularly terrific to image and to view in a telescope if your sky is very dark. So one of those is that I haven't talked about here. You've got, let's go back to actually, here's Sirius, here's Messier 50. And just below Messier 50, we've got the Seagull Nebula. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to put the brightness of the Milky Way back to something more normal. There we go. So this is the this is the Seagull Nebula. And this is a this is a nice target, a frequent target of rascals. So you want to check out that one. If you go by on up to Orion, obviously the rosette is terrific for imaging as well. If you go on up to Orion, there's that blob that I said I was going to come back to. This is the monkey head nebula. It's kind of in a mix of emission and reflection and some stars embedded within. That's a that's a terrific object. You've also got um the jelly, I think is it the jellyfish? I can't remember if that's its name, but there's a, a really faint but large nebula here near the star Propus. That would be another object you could go after. And if I head on up into Auriga, I talked about the three Messier open clusters and the letter Y open cluster here, but you've also got the flaming star nebula. And that's that's observable in a telescope optically, visually, if you've got a nice dark sky condition. So that's something you could image or view from a dark site with a larger aperture telescope, the flaming star. And then from here, we've got the California Nebula in Perseus. That's kind of on the edge of the Milky Way. It's not so much an, uh, a visual target, but you could certainly you could certainly use that as an as an imaging target. And a couple more that I wanted to mention down here. So beside the double cluster, we've got the Heart and the Soul Nebula emission nebulas right next door in basically in Cassiopeia. So those would be tough visually, but terrific for imaging. Uh, one that's not so tough visually is the Pac-Man Nebula. So here's the Pac-Man Nebula. Again, so just to kind of put everything buddy in perspective, we had we had the M we had the, the lawnmower cluster here. We had the owl cluster here. And now we've got down here, down near here, near Shedar and Atchard. The Pac-Man Nebula kind of makes a triangle with these two bright stars. This is another great. And I've actually seen this visually in a big aperture, you know, a 10, 8, 10, 12 inch aperture telescope. If you've got a dark, dark sky, you can make out its shape and see the stars within it, embedded within it. That's the Pac-Man. And the last one I was going to mention in this case was the Wizard Nebula. So the Wizard Nebula is down here. As sort of a reasonably small and concentrated emission nebula that you might be able to see in a big telescope. I can't remember whether I've actually um, taken a look at this one or not. I probably have, but uh, it's another one that you can check out. As, and as I said, just, just go, go crazy, start exploring. You'll find all kinds of neat things. All right, let's talk about winter cold weather stargazing. So I'll just share some of my experiences and, and tips around that. Um, let's see if I can. Might have some links to share, but not too much. So um, first, my first tip, let me stop sharing here for a second. So my first tip was clear your observing area of snow and ice because you know you want your telescope on a stable base you don't want to be you'll be out there in the dark so you don't want to be slipping on some black ice or something like that 
So get your observing area tidied up while you, you know, while it's daytime, don't burn, to, don't burn your night to doing that, get that ready ahead of time. So you'll be, you'll be happy you did that. Um, your telescope should be cooled down to the ambient temperature if, if it's the kind that has air trapped inside. Well, in both cases, but the kind that have air trapped inside are most important. So that means a refractor or a schmidt cassegrain or a Maxitov telescope, the kind that have the corrector plates on the front. Um, the air tends to be trapped inside there. And if you take it outside, it's full of warm house air. And you've got the cold outdoor air around it. And the uh, air inside is going to be trying to cool down. And as it does that, it's going to be churning inside your telescope. So you get a lot of that blurriness, mirage effect. It's sort of equivalent to viewing an object near the horizon to get that distortion due to the Earth's turbulence, the, the air turbulence. So you want to get those telescopes outdoors a couple of hours, if you can, before you're getting ready to observe. Um, if you're using a Newtonian reflector that has the big tube with the mirror in the base, those, those glass mirrors can be thick and heavy, and they also benefit from getting chilled down to the ambient temperature. So they'll want to be outside as well. So a couple things that, to bear in mind, though. You want to put your telescope where it's safe. So if you don't have a locked backyard or a gate, um, you could put it in the trunk of your car on the driveway or maybe in your garage if it's unheated to get yourself you know, as chill as chilled down as you can without there any be any risk of it um, getting messed with or taken. Uh, as well, you want to bear in mind that the um, the you know the bigger telescopes need more time than the smaller telescopes. So that's important. And I think that's mainly the idea that I wanted to mention. Um, in terms of binoculars, so I'm, I'm kind of they're kind of like two 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 modes of thought. Um, you could chill down your binoculars, but you then risk your warm eyeballs warming up the oculars and, and fogging them up. So some people opt to sort of keep their binoculars warm indoors, take them outside, use them, maybe tuck them back in their coat between uses, and they sort of, they sort of keep warm. I find that works fairly well. Oh, the other important thing about chilling down your telescope is make sure you have all the lens caps on. So keep the lens caps on while you're chilling it down. You could even potentially leave it in a in its case as long as the case isn't super insulated and not preventing it from cooling down. But you want to have the uh, the glass surfaces covered because that way they won't get frosted up or condensed on. Um, yeah. So there was another comment. We had a question about can you store? Is it okay to store a telescope in an unheated garage? So I store my Obsession Dobsonian in the garage pretty safely. Um, it's mostly made of sort of marine plywood with varnish on it to keep it protected, uh, aluminum piping, and mostly solid wood and, and sort of glass, and then the glass mirror, um, uh, metal, and then the glass mirrors. Um, if your telescope is an inexpensive department store telescope with lots of plastic parts, I'm not sure that I would keep it in outdoors or store it outdoors in the Canadian winter because that plastic can get brittle. Um, that sort of counts for when you're using it as well. So if you're outdoors with your inexpensive plastic parts telescope, you know, don't tighten the 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 the, 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 the clutches as much or the knobs as much as you might. Don't put as much pressure on them as you might normally, just because you know you could crack or break something if they're chilled way down. Um, so that, I don't know if I answered the binoculars question. I kind of do, I tend to be lazy and I sometimes do my binoculars viewing ad hoc. So they're warm and I just take them out, use them, put them in my coat, that sort of thing. We have um, kind of an extension on the telescopes. Your eyepieces, should they be chilled? Or is it too small to really make a difference? So I tend to, I actually tend to um, keep my eyepieces indoors and keep them capped and use a heating element around the eyepiece when I install them in the telescope. So they're kind of warm the whole time. And I find that that tends to help. That way your warm breath's not hitting a cold eyepiece and, and fogging it up. By the way, um, you know, if you forget to chill your telescope down, that's fine. It doesn't mean you can't observe that night. It just means that your views will improve through the night. 
So they'll start maybe a little bit blurry and they'll get better over time. Yeah, I'll come back to, I'll come back to some heating systems and, and suggestions here in a bit. Um, but while you're waiting, while, you know, while your telescope's out and chilling down, cooling down, um, that's a good time to be making your plan while you're inside and warm. You know, you're gonna make a plan of what you're gonna look, look at. You wanna know when the object's high enough to see it over your local trees and rooftops, uh, where, what direction it'll be, and maybe work out a viewing sequence. So you know what order you're gonna tackle the things in. Um, that'll actually make your observing time more efficient, means that you're out in the cold for less, less hours than you, than you need, otherwise needed to be. Um, then you can get back to the hot cocoa later on. Um, alcohol tends to degrade your visual acuity. So I don't know that I'd be, I'd be sipping brandy to keep warm while I'm observing. I tend to leave that for the end when I'm done. So that's an idea. But I do like to bring, uh, I like to bring green tea in a thermos. That's one of the things I do. Because it's not, it's not going to make me need to use the bathroom a lot or keep me up late when I'm ready to go to bed, that sort of thing. It's kind of gentle. But, but nice. Yeah. All right. So let's talk about keeping yourself warm when you do, when you are getting ready to go out. So obviously you can use the, um, you know, the little, the little warmers. So this, this is one of the, uh, the types with the sodium acetate solution. It's a waterproof plastic pouch. What you do is you boil these to reset them so they become liquid. And then when you're ready to use them, you give the little disc inside a little click and it, sets the, the uh, chemical reaction going, so, and it's an exothermic reaction. So when you boil them, you're putting the energy in, and then when you click the, the disc, the energy's coming out as heat. These tend to be hard in your pocket. They're more like putting stone or potato in your, in your pocket, a hot stone or a hot potato. So they're hard to slip into places. Um, and they don't, to my experience, they don't tend to stay warm that long, maybe a couple of hours. The ones I prefer are the less sustainable type, which are the disposable ones. Um, those are the ones that have a uh, an iron oxide powder inside them. When you expose them to oxygen, then they they give an exothermic reaction. So they tend to be they're soft and thin. You can slip them in the under the sole of your your feet in your boot, or put them in the palm of your glove, or you can you can even tuck them, you know, around your telescope to help keep your your corrector plate or your or, um, objective lens a little bit warmer to keep it from doing your frosting up. One tip for those though, is that once you take the air away from them, they stop the reaction. So you could start one, put it in an airtight Ziploc bag and then open it up the next night and it will start producing heat again if the, if the um, reactions aren't completely used up. So that's kind of a neat, neat way of using those. Then there are also the electric ones. You can now buy rechargeable electric uh, battery operated little pocket warmers that put in your pocket. And again, remember to remember to charge up the battery so you've got a good, you know, good long session with those. Some of the ones that you can buy, you can buy the, um, the, the clothing, the apparel that's heated up, either pants or coats. Make sure you charge the batteries up in those or have spares. And again, you've got to, you know, make sure your wiring is not getting pulled out and things like that. So. Yeah, those are some some suggestions. Any other questions? Another one is always dress warmer than you expect. And, you know, try to dress in layers because what I often find is I get overheated when I'm setting up, putting all the gear outside, getting everything ready. And then when I, it's time to sit down and relax and start observing, I'm now standing, sitting still and I get I get chilled down a lot faster. So. If you've got layers, then you could sort of have a coat off while you're setting up and then button that up when you're ready to start observing. Um, I really like wool socks. Those are, are really good. They seem to really help with the heat. Um, and the boots. So I recently had to buy new boots. And when I went to the boot store, I said, I want warm boots. What, what do you recommend? And the lady said, either Sorel's or Baffin brand boots in Canada. So uh, not that I'm endorsing anything particularly, but I happen to buy the Sorrells and their warm hugs. They're great. I love them. <laughs> so you want to look for things like 400 grams of insulation or rated for minus 32, minus 40, that sort of thing. Need like snowmobiling boots or something that's made for being outside and not necessarily being very active. Yeah. Um, one thing I was saying to Chris before everybody came on is I've had 
astronomers tell me that they get so involved at the eyepiece that they nearly get frostbite. So just be be cautious if you're one of those people that yeah. can get so so involved. Make sure you're consciously get like getting warm again. You don't have your hands out of your um, mitts for too long. While us in Ontario, our winter's been pretty mild. I have friends in uh, um, central Canada, and they're they're saying they're negative forty weather. So just be careful out there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Um, yeah. Also, um, you know, in terms of gloves, and uh, you can also use the layering principle for your gloves as well. So you can have a lighter pair of gloves that'll let you maybe draw on your right in your log or or adjust something that needs fine fingers. Um, and then have heavier mittens or something to put over top of that as well. So that's also another use. If you're using a tablet or a phone at the at the eyepiece, obviously you want that charged up before you go out because the cold really impacts the battery performance of those devices. Uh, it's nice if you can actually, if you've got AC power or a, or a battery pack, that you can keep them charging while you're using. It. That's a big help. And also consider um, consider having a stylus so that you don't have to take your gloves off to operate the tablet or phone. I often wear a stylus around on a lanyard around my neck that I just have handy that I can point things around. So that's a, another good piece of advice. Yeah, just be prepared that batteries run out faster. I yeah. don't know if Apple products have fixed their problem, but I remember that used to be an issue with a lot of iPhones. Um, let's finish up here, a couple more points, and then we'll, we'll get into our um, finest NGC fin to finish up. I mentioned about the plastic parts on the telescopes. You also might find that your go-to telescope um, sounds horrible in cold weather. I used to have a Mead SCT and it would positively screech when I was slewing it in the wintertime. I mean, they're basically made to do that. Um, so there's not really anything you have to be concerned about, but be ready to, to hear that, maybe that little struggle that they're doing in the cold weather. And again, yes, as you say, um, batteries don't like cold weather that much. So um, one suggestion is that some people like to put their battery pack in an insulated box like a cooler, like a like a beer box or um or a regular cooler. Um, and you could even put one of those, just a, one of those hand warmers inside the box with the battery and just to keep the conditions in there a little bit warmer, the battery will will last a bit longer for you. Um, in terms of the kind of dew control, frost control, you know, what you're concerned about is the dew point. That's a, usually at or a little bit above the ambient temperature. And you want to make sure your optics can stay above that, and that'll keep them free of dew or frost. If you do get some dew or frost on your um, objective lens, your corrector plate, your eyepieces, you can actually um, blow them with some cool air. I wouldn't use a hot air blower on them or hot air dryer on them, but you could blow them with cool air. That often helps. Um, and as I, as I mentioned, if you've got some of the portable little flexible hand warmer pouches, um, if you've got some elastic bands or something that you can do to, to strap on one of those hand warmers on the underside of your telescope, then the heat will rise and it'll keep the, the lens a little bit clearer in that way. Um, I actually have a strap that I bought, a USB strap. So you can buy a professional dew heating system with, um, with a controller and straps and things like that. I actually went out and bought a USB strap. Um, Samantha could put the um, the link in the chat if you want. It wasn't very expensive. It just plugs into any USB battery that has a USB port. And it works really well. It's got three temperature settings. And I just put that, it's made for a camera lens. You can put it around a coffee mug. I just basically make it about three inches in diameter and I just drape it over my eyepiece. So if I switch eyepieces, I just change the eyepiece and I hang it over the new eyepiece and that keeps it, my eyepieces nice and clean. Um, you might want to consider making, if you don't have any, you know, dew control system, um, just make a dew shield. It'll it'll extend your observing time. May not eliminate it from happening, but at least give you more time to look. Um, you can get a roll of uh, of thin dark foam, preferably black, a dark color. You know, craft foam or cardboard, Bristol board, anything that's kind of going to extend a tube, your tube about one one and a half or so times the dam times the aperture or diameter of your of your telescope tube out in front so it won't obscure too much of the sky and it'll also keep the the air from getting onto your um, your op, your um, objective lens i think that's basically it the other the other two points i was going to make is 
When you're ready to finish up for the night, assuming you want to bring your telescope or your equipment or your camera indoors with you at the end of the night, put all the caps back on while it's still cold outside. If you have the box or case for your telescope, pack it inside and zip it shut. And that way the ambient warm air won't condense all the moisture in that air onto your telescope when you carry it inside. So do all that while you're still outside. Zip it closed. If you don't have a, a case or something for your telescope, you know, even a garbage bag, you can cinch around the whole tripod and just sort of put some bungees or something around, uh, collect it around the, the top of the mount. And that'll actually prevent as much of the warm air from getting onto your telescope. Uh, finally, a couple more things. You can actually skip winter by looking at the winter sky in autumn. So if you were to say, wanted to look at Orion and Gemini and Orion, all those constellations, uh, get up before sunrise in mid-October and enjoy it with a sweater on. And you can do all your start your winter stargazing for an hour or two before sunrise in the winter. So 5 a.m. on October 15th gives you just what you get at the end of January at 7 p.m. and much warmer temperatures. Or book a trip south. Take your telescope where it's warm. So that's my advice on, on what cold weather is here. I'll we'll say when I got up early for the uh, lunar eclipse, I made sure to look at Orion because I, I never am up that early. Um, so we have a few more questions before we move on to our um, finds and GCs. Is there anything to, um, somebody says my go-to hand controller LCS is really slow when it starts to get cold. Are there any workarounds for that or just kind of? Okay, well, I'm obviously we can't, we can't speak as the manufacturer. So this is all at your own personal risk. Um, I might I might be considered to get a rubber band and a and a hand warmer and strap it to the back of my hand controller. That might help. Again, I'm not saying if that's advisable or not, but I think I'd probably do it to mine if I had that problem. Let um, us know if it works. True. Um, this is kind of you just said travel south but somebody wanted to ask what is your favorite like southern thing you've seen in the southern hemisphere what southern constellation thrilled you the most that was oh man so i had i was i had this is for another day but i had a chance to go to an observatory in new zealand mount john observatory at the new moon in the spring of 2017 and it was too windy to do a uh, photography so we just did visual astronomy and they put this one meter telescope, we looked through a one meter telescope at the, um, at the Eta Carina Nebula in the core of the Carina Nebula. The, it's called the Homunculus. And it literally looked like two candle flames flickering because the air was turbulent. And that was just awesome. But if you ever have a chance to go to the Oz Sky Sky Safari, that's put on by the local amateur astronomers in um, north of Sydney. It's near the Siding Spring Observatory in Warrumbuggles, Australia. Coonabara brand is the town. Um, they supply the telescopes. You just bring your eyeballs and your list of things to look at, and uh, you can't beat it. It's amazing. The, the jewel box, the coal sack, crux, the dark doodad, uh, Omega Centauri. Yeah, go. Cool. It's great. So when you go on your bucket list trip to Australia or New Zealand, make sure you remember to stargaze while you're down there. Um, so two more kind of going back to the comet. Um, some was asking, what's the approximate like, diameter of the body of the comet? Do you know that? I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm not too sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe somebody's looked that up or can Google that for us. I will Google that. Um, and then while I'm Googling that, um, another, so what was the name of the observatory in Sydney you were saying? So the name of the observatory is the Siding Spring Observatory, but that's not where the, um, the Sky Safari is done. It's about a half an hour drive from the observatory. It's the name of the organization or the event. It's an annual event. It's called the Oz Sky, O-Z-S-K-Y, Safari, Oz Sky Safari. If you Google that, you'll find you'll find the organizers and uh, and book it. It's worth it. The last time I was there, I was there with four or five other rascals, including Alan Dyer was there with me, and it was great. Um, so we have, I just looked this up, if it is wrong, but this is what I'm seeing online, is about one kilometer. 
um, in diameter for the for the uh, comet. Um, and finally, um, what would you recommend to view the comet, an eight inch Smith Cassegrain or an 80 millimeter APO? Oh, well, visually, the more aperture, the better, really. Um, if you want to, if you want to see it at its brightest, then you want more aperture into your eyeballs. So if you're planning to view it with your eyes, if you've got an eight inch SCT, that would be my way to go. Um, I happened, I was feeling too, uh, too lazy to get the big Dobsonian out and collimate it the other night. So I just stuck with the binoculars and I was quite delighted, but I really probably should have pulled the big telescope out. Um, I mentioned it. I, I texted Blake Nancaro and he ended up getting his binoculars out and also his little um, ETX-90 telescope. And he was quite happy to th did that. Um, if you're going to image it, then you don't need as big of a telescope. So, you know, put your camera on the back of your small APO and you're probably going to get a good picture. But get look look with the biggest scope you have. Sounds good. Okay. And I think that um, somebody just mentioned they didn't see much with their 100 millimeter refractors. That just kind of goes along with the biggest scope you have. Go for it. And with that, I think it's time to go on to our uh, finest NGCs corner, which we have some very fine NGCs today. We do. So one of the things about the N the finest NGC is not some of them are are as bright or brighter than the Messiers, but there are some challenges in here as well. So you know, please excuse the fact that some of these are going to be a little bit tricky, a little bit harder to see, but they're definitely worth um, worth pursuing. So I've got, um, basically we're gonna do, try to do about five objects uh, per session, per insider's guide. And that'll get us through the winter targets in the next two months, basically. Um, the other thing is that, you know, the, well, let's just, let's just get into it here. So what we're doing is we're gonna look at the nighttime sky tonight. Oh, the other, the other thing I was gonna say is, is that this, because we are kind of forced to um, talk about a limited number of winter targets, um, regardless of the moon phase, then we're going to actually need to mention some dim objects, even while the moon is bright. So one of the things about this week is that we've got a waxing moon that's going to get full towards the end of the week, but I'm still going to mention some dim objects that you can just wait till next week and take a look at. So I'll show you where they are, give you my suggestions on finding them and viewing them, but you might want to wait until next week for the serious, um, to seriously tackle them. Okay, here we go. So first up I've got, we just gonna, gonna highlight these. So first up, I'm gonna mention the Eye of God galaxy. This is uh, NGC 1232. It's located in Eridanus. You can see that it's quite low in the sky. So it's already past the meridian. We always wanna look at objects that are fainter when they're highest in the sky. And at 8 p.m. tonight, it's already in the western half of the sky. But since the sky gets dark at about 6.30, you can actually look at this object, you know, right after dinner. As soon as, it, as, soon as dusk is done, maybe um, 6.45, 7 p.m., head out. That's when it'll be above the southern horizon. It's only about 23 degrees above the horizon. For Montreal, it's going to vary. That's going to be a little bit higher, a little bit lower, depending on which city you are in the country. Let me just center this up and zoom in a little bit. So it's kind of an underappreciated gem. Here it is zoomed in. It's a really beautiful face on spiral galaxy. It was discovered by William Herschel on October 20th, 1784. It's number 258 of his class two objects. This would be visible in binoculars. And in any size of a telescope under a dark sky, if it were a bit higher. So, you know, in Canada, maybe that's not ideal for us. But, you know, if you take your binoculars a little bit south, then you could probably see it in your binoculars from, you know, somewhere in the States. Um, it actually resembles Messier 101. It's what I did to find it is I actually take my Telrad. So I'm just going to actually put on my Telrad here. So the Telrad has a half degree, two degree, and four degree rings. Don't worry about the uh, green rings for here for a second. So the Telrad is this. And if you put the Telrad kind of the outer ring on the line connecting 
the star Angatenar and T3. These are all, by the way, these stars are all T Eridanus. You can see there's nine, eight, six, five, four, three, two, one. You can see these in binoculars very, very easily. So once you spot this row of crooked row of stars in binoculars, you want to find the one, two, three, three and four star and put your kind of your finder with the the T4 star just outside the bottom left edge. And that would be your field of view that you want to do you want to look for. Um, don't over magnify it. You know, uh, what you can do is search at low power and then maybe use something like 65 power to zoom in. Here's the kind of the field. Whoops, let me just pick this object and do this. Let's just do this. There we go. So that's that's viewing it around 65x, 64, 65x. Um, you'll want to use averted vision on this target because it's a bit um, spread out and not as bright as some of the other art targets that we look at. And you want to be mentioning or noting down um, the shape, whether you can see any structure in it, whether you can see the hints of the arms. The arms are quite separated in places. Um, you might even be able to see the little tiny companion galaxy if you have a big telescope. So just zoom back in here. So there's a little tiny companion galaxy. Um, this has actually been given um, the ARP. So Halton ARPS, it's part of Halton ARPS list of peculiar galaxies, mainly because he thinks that this companion may have altered the symmetry of the main galaxy. So that's, that's one, it's about 65 million light years away. You wanna get that one earliest in the evening, this time of the year. Up next, we've got the Cleopatra's eye, and this is one of these more challenging ones that I mentioned. So this is sitting here in the winding stars of Eridanus. It's to the west of the bright star Rigel, and it's a bright planetary nebula. It's one of the brighter planetary nebulas in the sky, actually. It's got a greenish blue or grayish disk it's got a brighter interior and the central star is quite prominent. So it's a bit, so it's basically as bright as the Parca Nebula, what we used to call the Eskimo Nebula um, in Gemini. So it's, if you've looked at that one, you'll have a sense of how bright this one is. Discovered by William Herschel on February 1st. So tomorrow in 1785, it's number 26 on his class four. It's visible really in any size of telescope, but it only gets about a third of the way up the Southern sky for, Can for Canadians, so that's one of the disadvantages. Um, now, what I use is, is I picked the star, if you look at the star Arnib, down here, the brightest star in Lepus, and you connect that to, where's my septrum? Here we go. So this line through septrum and up through Rana. So you can actually, if you can see, you can see Arnib and Mu and septrum and Rana, then the Cleopatra's eye is basically midway almost midway between Skeptrum and Rana in Eridanus. That's a good way of finding it. Um, if you can see the star Zorak, then what you can do is use that one. Oops, let me do this. And put your Telrad, you know, one or two ring gaps to the left of Zorak, and that'll center it up in your, in your telescope. What I'll do is I'll put it in the simulated view of the eyepiece again here. Here we go. You can see it's really, really tiny at 64x. You're gonna need lots more magnification than you usually need for some of these objects. Um, you can use a, if you're if you're in the neighborhood and you're not sure you're seeing it yet, that's when you could pop in your oxygen three filter because it'll that filter will brighten up this nebula and dim the other star. So it'll, it'll become more prominent in your field of view. Then when you're there, you can crank up the magnification even as much as 200x or even more, th more than that. You want to look for the central star, look for the shape of the object, um, and then try some different magnifications with and without the filter and see what you can uh, what you can discern about it. So that's a neat one. Okay, another planetary nebula is the crystal ball. It's the crystal ball nebula. Is up here at the top of Taurus. So this year we've got Mars kind of the guide our way. If you look at Aldebaran and Mars and kind of take a little bit of a jog to the west, you can pick up the patch of the sky where the crystal ball nebula is. Zoom in here a little bit. This is um, this is a neat one. It's an irregular glow around 
a prominent central star discovered by William Herschel on November 13, 1790. It's number 69 in his class four objects. Um, the central star is bright enough to see in your binoculars, but you're going to need a telescope to see a nebulosity around it. But it's kind of a neat way to kind of get yourself in the neighborhood with your binoculars and then, um, then pull out the telescope. Um, where it's located, it's about midway between Aldebaran and Murfak. So let me just wind back here so you can see it. So there's Aldebaran and there's Murfak, the brightest star in Perseus. And it's right on the line between them and it's about halfway between them. So that's one way you can get yourself in the neighborhood. It's also on the line between Zeta Tauri, which is the lower horn tip star and the Gorgon Gorgonea Tertia star. So you could sort of use these two as well. Or you could just take the bottom stars in the arm, the leg or arm of Perseus that comes down here. And at the distance from Attic, this Attic, which is Omicron to Zeta Persei, and basically sort of triple that or two and a half times that, that span. And that'll put you in the neighborhood as well. Uh, when you're here, look for some of these field stars. It sort of sits in this triangle of field stars. It might even look like one of the stars itself until you zoom in on a little bit more. And what you're going to look for when you're doing it is you're going to use averted vision to see more of the more of the details. Maybe that oxygen three filter, if you have that, um, try different magnifications. Note the structure, see if you can see its weird shape. It's got some weird shapes to it. And uh, that's something to, to note down. It's about 2000 light years away. All right, that's number three. All right, number four is the one that Samantha mentioned earlier, and that is the Cosmic bat slash fox face. This is actually one that I wrote up in the Sky News Beyond Messier column this month. And this is neat because there's kind of something for everybody in this target. So you've got the brightest section here, but then you've got some faint extensions to it, various um, types of dark dust. So this would be a terrific imaging target. And make sure that when you're framing the image that you pick up the pieces of it to the west and to the south. So you can get this all almost, it's almost like a straight arm, straight arm, straight arm effect. So it's about, yeah, it's about two arc minutes in diameter um, of this of the small part, but it does get bigger. This is um one of Sidney Vandenberg's reflection nebulae, number 33 in his list. It was discovered by William Herschel though, back in February 1st, 1786. It's number 32 on his class five targets. Um, what you can do is use the, there's different ways of doing it. You can use, uh, let's see, I put the Rigel and the bottom star of Orion Shield. So if you can see this little row of stars that make Orion Shield or, or, or Lion's Pelt, then this object would be about midway between the bottom star and Rigel. That's one way of doing it. Or what you could do is use your Telrad again or your Finder. Okay, and if you put your finder with respect to the star Cursa, which is a pretty bright star, it's a, it's a, it's a naked eye star, magnitude 2.7. So you can put the outer ring of your Telrad there and you'll be pretty much in the neighborhood of the, of the cosmic bat fox face. All right, so let's talk about the, the nickname. So um, in the telescope, in a smaller telescope, you're really gonna be limited to the brightest part of the nebula. What you're gonna see here is kind of a, uh, a flattish area and then wings extending up to either side. And then there's a dark dust lane here that sort of cuts off the bottom and it gives that bat wing effect. Um, in terms of the fox face, I'm not sure what they mean by the fox face. Maybe they mean these are the ears sticking up. I'm not too sure, but, uh, but that's what you're going to look for. In terms of the magnification, you don't want to over magnify this one because it's pretty large. So that's, again, this is looking with a 14 millimeter plossal at 60 power. You could also probably start with the 30, you know, the 25 or 26 millimeter plossal at half that magnification. So use your averted vision. Um, filters aren't gonna help very much because filters don't brighten up reflection nebula. So that's because they're reflecting starlight and these filters are designed to diminish, diminish starlight at the expense of the emission. And these are more reflected starlight. So it doesn't help very much to use a filter, but you could try, you can experiment with it. But you do want to look for the various field stars. It's in a 
interesting, busy little field of stars and uh, see what shape you can detect of that. So that's kind of a neat one. That's about 1600 light years away. And last up, we've got the Running Man Nebula in Orion's belt. So this, this sometimes gets a little bit less love than it should just because it's sitting next to the terrific and fantastic M42, M43 complex, the Orion Nebula complex. But what we're looking at, so if you zoom back on the belt, when you're looking at Orion's belt in binoculars or even with the unaided eye, you generally see sort of three bright patches. The middle bright patch tends to be the Orion Nebula. Um, if your eyes are good and you're, you're using binoculars, you might see, say, four bright patches. So one, two, three, four. And the third one, or the second one from the top, is this um, sort of a combination of emission and a reflection nebulosity called the Running Man Nebula. It's actually composed of several NGC objects sort of combined together. I've got mine dialed down, so they're not all showing up in this particular um, set of symbols. But So we're looking at... Um, um, discovered by William Herschel back in January 30th, 30th of 1786. It's number 30 of his class five. The young stars that are within it are naked eye brightness. So you can see those, actually, as I said, just looking at the, the sword. Um, the binoculars will show hints of the nebulosity in a dark sky, but really you want to grab your telescope and see if you can see the nebulosity around it. Um, because it's a mix of types of, of nebulosity, you can try your O3 or UHC filter, but I'm not optimistic that they're going to help very much in this case. It's more important to have a dark sky and maybe a bigger aperture telescope. Again, don't over magnify it, maybe 50 power. Um, but then when you're done looking at the nebula, then you want to zoom in on the stars inside because some of these are double stars. So they'll, they'll, they'll resolve into a little pair. So um, then when you're done, don't, don't leave yet. You can go on up and look at the coal car. This set of stars up here in GC 1981 is kind of a mini asterism. They, the nickname for this is the coal car. It's kind of a boxy thing with a handle and other stuff. So this, uh, this complex is about 1,500 light years away. So that, there you go, Samantha. There's your cosmic bat slash fox face nebula. Thank you. There's some, there's some really good targets in here. And as we, when we do these, just a reminder, as you're saying with the moon, we usually put them in two weeks chunks of when you can see them. So yeah, try them when they're out there. Uh, does anybody yeah. have any questions about NGCs? We're just at five o'clock here. Um, yeah, so basically the only one- about heated stuff to go outside with. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the in, terms of, in terms of when to look at these, the only ones you're kind of in a, in a hurry for would be the the two in Eridanus. Otherwise, you've got kind of all the rest of the winter to see the one, the other ones I mentioned. Okay. Well, I don't see any questions. Um, we are back on Valentine's Day. I think that's our next episode is February 14th. Um, so stay tuned. Any any last things, Dad, before we just thank you right now? That's great. <laughs> yeah, good luck, everybody. Hopefully you can see the comet the next few nights and get some pictures and let us let us see them on social media. And uh, we haven't quite decided on our next topic, but we're gonna pick something fun and we'll see you in two weeks. So keep looking yeah. out. Bye everyone. Clear.